everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the special meeting of the Toowoomba Regional Council. This, this meeting is uh, open to the public and will also be live streamed. I'd like to thank those of you in the room today with us and acknowledge everyone by watching via the social media channels. Um, could I firstly uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we meet, um, the Western Waka, Waka Jarawa, Gaibal and Bigambal people to the west of us. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and um, acknowledge their song lines and long um, attachment, uh, intimate attachment to this land uh, on which we meet today. Could I also acknowledge uh, uh, my fellow colleagues, uh, Councillor Jeff, who's acting mayor at the moment, deputy mayor, uh, and all of my council colleagues here this afternoon. Can I act, uh, acknowledge the acting CEO, Mike Brady, and uh, the general manager, Stuart Summers, for planning and development. And uh, acknowledge uh, those in the gallery as well to thank you for your attendance. Now, if we go to item two, attendance, including apologies, leave of absence, granting of leave, of absence, declarations of conflict of interest. There's no known apologies, but we have two uh, leave of absences for noting, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan and uh, Councillor Paul Antonio. There's no resolution required. And remiss of me, Councillor Rebecca, I needed to acknowledge you uh, joining us online as well. So there's no resolution for granting a leave of absence. Um, Councillor Rebecca, we go uh, straight to you. Uh, you've got a declarable conflict of interest that you'd like to make the meeting aware of. Thanks, uh, Councillor Rebecca. Any questions from councillors regarding Councillor Rebecca's conflict? If no. Um, uh, Councillor Melissa, if you've got a conflict. Just before you leave, um, Councillor Rebecca, we'll get uh, Councillor Melissa to declare a conflict as well, mate. Thank you, Chair. This declaration of declarable conflict, conflict of interest is in relation to item number four, MCUI 2021-1085, Material Change of Use, Impact, Food and Drink Outlet 117 to 119 Ruthven Street, Harlaxton, Queensland, 4350. I request that it be minuted that I declared a declarable conflict of interest in relation to item number four at the special meeting of Council of 20th of April 2022 and of Council's decision to allow me to participate in the decision about the matter, including by voting on the matter. As the relevant circumstances have not changed, I will participate in the decision about the matter, including by voting on the matter. Thanks, Councillor Melissa. Um, no questions, councillors? If not, um, we will move to item... Yes, uh, Council, thanks. Uh, Councillor Rebecca, um, could you uh, indicate you're leaving the meeting, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 
<clears throat> if we move to uh, item three, uh, suspension of standing orders, or item four it is. Um, in three? I've got a three and a four on my run sheet, but anyway. So you want to make a move? I forgot to mention that we've we've had a declaration by the two councillors. So moved by Councillor Taylor, seconded by Councillor James. Uh, you guys don't mind first names, do we? As long as it's Councillor, you yeah, okay? Um, okay. So what we'll do? We just need to vote on that. Oh, sorry. Uh, those in favour. It's carried. Thanks, Councillor Bill. Um, so what we'll do, uh, just before Richard comes up to the officer to present uh, the information, um, this is, councillors, this is uh, a meeting to consider the additional information that was requested from the last meeting. Uh, I want to bring to your attention, councillors. Um, gentlemen, would you mind standing up if I, when I call your name, so councillors? Uh, Mr Cameron Stanley, your Director for Urbis, on behalf of the applicant, and Mr Ryan Collier, um, the Development Manager for McDonald's are here, uh, and any of the submitters, um, councillors, uh, when we go through the officer's presentation, and uh, if you have any questions for him or either the applicant or submitters, feel more than welcome to uh, ask a question I can ask them to come forward to the um, microphone and, and we can go from there. Is that okay? Okay. Righto. So, Richard, would you like to come and give us your presentation, please? Once again, I'll probably speak too closely or be too far away from the microphone. I never get it right. Um, so thanks uh, today for, um, for this, uh, to, to be able to present this. Um, I guess I just wanted to allude to the fact there's a couple of attachments which might take a little bit of time to bring up as we go through it. Um, they're not critical because uh, at the end of the day I can just describe, but if we do get the attachments up, that'll be great. Um, so I'll start off. Um, the first one I'll just bring up just to bring the context is just uh, attachment 10, if you could, which is the aerial view, but um, you're probably still familiar with the site, obviously. Um, so this presentation uh, relates to a development application, MCUI 2021-1085, uh, being material change of use for a food and drink outlet, located at 117 to 119 Rutherford Street, Harlexton. The application was presented at the special meeting of council on the 20th of April 2022 by an independent development consultancy, and that was Real Planning uh, Proprietary Limited, with the recommendation that the application be approved subject to conditions. Following council's deliberation after that, uh, during that process, a motion was carried and uh, that motion was that this matter be deferred for consideration at a future special meeting of council to allow further information to be provided in relation to traffic studies, impact to amenity as a result of shadowing, height of acoustic fencing and retaining wall, and Jones Street Road dedication. So to clarify, the purpose of today's presentation is to give a brief summary of the additional information provided by the applicant in response to these matters. Uh, this information is provided to assist councillors to make an informed decision in relation to the independent development consultancy's uh, original recommendation to approve the development. Uh, so the information that's been provided can be best broken into five categories, that being the acoustic information, uh, the conceptual civil levels and retaining wall design, uh, additional cross sections and combined wall heights, additional shadowing diagrams and the traffic engineering solution. So I might just uh, bring it up to attachment three now, if I could. Uh, if we could just go to probably just scroll down to about page 10, uh, which is the site plan. So if we just scroll through this quickly, about I think it's about page 10. So it's very staggering, yeah, and just scroll it out. Um, the reason I bring this one up is because this is in relation to the acoustic barrier, and I just wanted to give context to the site that obviously the original application, and I apologise none of the pointers are working, but uh, if you look at the, I suppose, the left-hand bottom corner of the, 
the screen. There's the uh, area of land to be dedicated and under the original plans it showed the acoustic barrier extending sort of right up to that road reserve uh, and, and that was one of the issues that was raised that did this have an impact in relation to the acoustic reporting. So I'll leave it on that for the moment, just have a quick discussion. Uh, so with regards to that, uh, the revised noise modelling has been considered <coughs> and this was a additional information provided by MWA uh, Environmental. Uh, now this information had taken into account the removal of that acoustic or that portion of the acoustic fence from the land dedication area adjoining Jones Street. The information provides notes with particular reference to the revised acoustic barrier location <coughs> that all operational aspects of the proposed ref uh, restaurant have been taken into account including the location of the speaker box uh, and the cars driving through the site and the drive through have also been considered. Uh, as an additional note uh, that the modelling also takes into account the 24-hour, uh, seven-day operation proposed by the applicant. Um, and uh, this obviously has been uh, considered by the original uh, assessment of the application through, the, uh, uh, through real planning. Uh, and there is nothing in this modelling that suggests that the uh, noise generated through that seven-day uh, uh, seven operation, 24-hour-a-day, would give rise to noise concern as per the information provided. Uh, so that condition, just for reference sake, I believe is condition 89 of the recommended condition set, which basically allows for the 24 hour, uh, seven day a week operation, but it does uh, give some limitations with regard to service vehicle movements uh, and refuse uh, collection as well, uh, which are limited to the, between the hours of 7 a.m. Uh, and, and 10 p.m. for the gen general service vehicle movements uh, and 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the uh, refuse uh, collection. Uh, so just summarising that the original report and revised modelling has considered the development as proposed uh, and it concludes that the detailed noise assessment and modelling of those components uh, which they've gained from a typical McDonald's uh, restaurant uh, have been done and it's been demonstrated to be compliant with the planning scheme noise criteria. Um, obviously there are more diagrams but uh, there's probably not a lot, uh, a great deal of point in showing them. There's a couple of others which show the noise modelling data but ultimately the, the uh, summary I've provided uh, basically shows that it's all within the acceptable criteria. Um, we might move to attachment four if we could and page three if you would. Uh, this relates to the finished site level question, I suppose, and the uh, retaining wall design. And additional information was provided by Richmond and Ross uh, in relation to that. Uh, and the plan that we bring up is about page three. It should be, an, yeah, that one. Um, so basically, the reason I show that one is because it just shows an aerial view of the site uh, with an overlay of the proposed development, um, including uh, the proposed overland flow path. Uh, and so in summary, this information provides that the retaining wall design is reflective of the floor fall across the site, and that's particularly because the northwestern corner is a lot lower to, uh, uh, is it, I suppose the Jones Street frontage drains away to the northwestern corner, so that's necessitated the need to provide some cut and fill on the site. <coughs> the levels were set to ensure that the overland flows in the event of a blockage of the stormwater system would actually uh, flow to the crossover to Jones Street uh, and would ensure no worsening to the neighbouring properties. The low point of the crossover to Jones Street and the car parking area maintains a valley to ensure the appropriate stormwater runoff is maintained in an overland sort of flow event if, if, the block, if there is a blockage of the drains. Um, stormwater alignment design was considered through the adjacent properties by way of securing an easement over this land to drain to Wattle Street and that's the properties to the west. Um, however, the location of the existing structures, and that's the houses and the sheds, proved that they would not be, uh, be able to be kept clear of the overland flow paths. Um, and of course, they also considered the lowering of the overall building pad. Um, however, this would have resulted in an increased cut height, uh, cut and retaining wall. And uh, retaining walls would have been, uh, I suppose the building would have been basically dropped a lot lower, requiring a greater need, uh, level of cut along the eastern boundary adjoining Ruthven Street. Um, so yeah, so that's probably a quick, as I say, this is a very quick overview. You're welcome to have some questions afterwards. Um, so we might move on to uh, attachment five if I could. 
And this relates to the uh, acoustic barriers and retaining wall heights. So I um, might just get you to go to page two when it opens. Um, so basically this relates to, as I say, your retaining wall heights and also the applicants provided some additional cross sections as well, just to give some clarity surrounding the extent of cut and fill uh, and the extent of the retaining wall and uh, acoustic barrier height and its, I suppose its actual height in relation to the adjoining properties. Um, the reason I've gone to number two, and I might just, just scroll a little bit further down to cross section, whoop, that'll do. So the bottom one there in the bottom left hand corner is cross section D. Uh, and uh, the reason I've shown that one is because that's basically the one that shows um, the probably the highest uh, combined house. So basically what you're looking at there is uh, the acoustic fence and the uh, retaining wall height uh, at that cross section D and that's, I'm sorry to say it's very hard to read probably on that plan but it's on that bottom one, yep, on the right hand side there. If we look at that, the total height of that at that section is 3.2 metres. So that's including, I believe it's, uh, and I might have that wrong, but I think it's a two metre high retaining uh, acoustic fence at that point. Uh, but it could be slightly higher. I think it's two, though. So, um, But basically what that's showing is that everywhere else where they've done, uh, I suppose, the combined uh, uh, retaining wall heights and the, the acoustic fence, you're, not, you're never looking at, a, I suppose, a cross-section that's greater than about 3.2 metres. Uh, and the reason this is uh, relevant and why I've picked cross-section D is because it happens to be, I suppose, that... Uh, the northern rear boundary of the adjoining land which would potentially be worst impacted by the amount of fill and indeed by the amount of overshadowing and uh, in a moment I'll show you the uh, overshadowing diagrams to, to hopefully alleviate any concerns there. Um, as I say, there's a whole set of drawings there, probably not much point in going through them all but they're there. Uh, but it is important to note that uh, every effort has been made by the applicant to basically uh, base, uh, step back that retaining wall where it has actually exceeded over that one metre height or getting close to that. So they've actually stepped it uh, to make sure that that impact on the adjoining uh, neighbouring properties is, is, is main, uh, well, it's limited as much as possible. So I might just move to attachment six, if I could. Uh, and this one relates to the shadowing diagram. So that's probably of a great deal of interest, I would have thought. And just page two, if I could, so that one there. Um, so basically, these shadow diagrams have been updated uh, effectively in response to, to, to Council's uh, request. Uh, now what I will say is the proposed retaining wall and acoustic fence over shadow diagram is provided on the right hand side of the page. So uh, basically that's on that side. That's showing basically the proposal as would be if um, approved and constructed with the retaining wall and the acoustic fence. Now that's 9am in the morning. Uh, when the greatest amount of overshadowing will occur. And as you can see, uh, the drawing basically shows the one where it is overshadowing. Uh, the worst property is 28 Ross, uh, Wattle Street. And uh, you can see the majority of the rear yard uh, remains uh, or maintains direct access to sunlight. And only that, I suppose, that small uh, northeastern corner of the house would be subject to some overshadowing. Uh, if I could just get you to scroll down now to the next page, just keeping your eye, I guess, on the right-hand side. That's the 12 a.m. Uh, and as you can see, it's, a, it's actually a, a lot less overshadowing impact on that property. And then if we just scroll down to 3 p.m., uh, as you can see, it's slightly, as it's the way that the sun arcs over, I guess, um, there's a slight bit more overshadowing, but basically the house and the vast majority of the, uh, the open space and indeed only a very small portion of the the northern portion of the shed is actually affected. Now what's important to note with these diagrams is they're taken uh, on the winter solace, uh, which is the 20th, oh, sorry, the 21st of June of 2021. So this is basically where overshadowing is at its worst uh, at winter. Um, so for the rest of the year, it actually, the shadows get, uh, I suppose, less, um, less have less impact. Uh, just bringing it over now as a point of comparison, the applicant has actually done on the, uh, I suppose, on the left-hand side of the screen there, uh, done the 9, 12 and 3 p.m. And as I say, just scroll back up through them if you would. Um, now what this would show, or does show, is I guess by way of comparison, is a shadowing impact of a code compliant two-storey house or multiple dwelling. Um, and this is basically taking into account uh, a 
uh, 8 to 2.4 metre setback from the side boundary. And as you can see, uh, if you were to do a code compliant house on this property, you could actually end up uh, with a worse situation. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, that would happen, but it is, I suppose, by way of a comparison, giving rise to uh, what the scheme could conceivably allow if you didn't allow a, uh, a commercial type development here and we just went with a residential development. So it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting comparison. So I suppose in summary of that, it just goes, I suppose, demonstrates that the adjoining house, and particularly uh, 28 Rock Wattle Street, uh, well, all of them for that matter, uh, receive, I guess, at least uh, three hours is all that's required under the scheme, uh, access to sunlight. Uh, and that includes, that's the house, the habitable areas of the house, and that's indeed uh, at least a minimum 16 square metres of the actual private open space. And I think the diagrams show that it's quite a lot more area than that. So it actually does, it's quite compliant with the scheme. Um, and finally, I might get you to move to attachment seven. So I apologise once again, we're jumping all over the place. Um, and what this is just going to show is just that additional detail uh, that was requested in relation to the lane widening along Jones Street. Uh, so if that first diagram there, uh, that simply shows the lane reconfiguration included uh, that was included in the previous reporting, um, but it's, guess it's just taken an aerial shot of the, uh, the current situation and overlaid the development uh, with that turning lane uh, shown in there. And as you can see, you've got basically a dedicated uh, right and a dedicated left turning lane for vehicles exiting John Street onto Ruthven Street. Um, so that was one of the diagrams uh, requested just to show how that looks. Uh, if we go to the next page... Uh, that diagram is being added in there. Basically, it shows the swept path um, from, a, I guess, a vehicle uh, accessing the adjoining North Point Centre. And you can see there in that little hatched area as well at the, the front of the driveway there, uh, we'll cross over into it, uh, we've got a section there which basically has the keep clear line marking in Jones Street just to ensure that that entrance remains, I suppose, free of vehicles. And uh, in conjunction with the uh, additional lane widening works and... Uh, those matters that I suppose demonstrates what we were alluding to um, under the previous meeting that basically there's more capacity in the Jones Street uh, network now to cater for additional queuing and that it doesn't uh, technically impact the existing or worsen the existing situation. Uh, and the final one I'll just throw in for good measure. Uh, so that's just the next page and one down if we could. Uh, just scroll down to the diagram. Um, that one's really just showing uh, the overall look of the situation when you consider, I suppose, Jones Street and indeed uh, Rothman Street uh, and just how it sort of relates to the overall lane marking um, uh, situation. And with regards to the, the plans, I suppose, in context, I'm not a traffic engineer, but uh, uh, these diagrams were, I believe, prepared by Lambert and uh, Rabin or Rabine, uh, which basically shows that, 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 that the uh, proposed traffic mitigation uh, measures, namely the, uh, the additional turning lane in Jones Street, uh, is, is actually well, uh, is well within limits of, of, of ensuring that you get adequate uh, traffic movement to and from the site in relation to their conclusions uh, from the traffic engineering report that they've prepared. Um, and as noted by those, the engineers, they basically said that the, the 30 metre short turn lane in Jones Street has purposely been implemented to specifically reduce queuing delays uh, and it's also taken into account the traffic movement on the greater network uh, and has not led to a, to a situation which is a worsening, I suppose. Um, so that probably concludes the overall, I suppose, a quick rundown of the additional information provided. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying, uh, having regard to this, uh, the additional information that's been supplied, uh, there's, it look, it's considered that no conflict arises with regard to the original recommendation prepared by real planning uh, to approve the application subject to conditions. Um, with the exception of condition uh, six of the original approval, which simply has included some revised uh, site plan to show the removal of the acoustic fence uh, from the land dedication area adjoining Jane Street, um, a couple of updated cross-sectional plans with that updated information and the acoustic barrier location plans, and this is simply replacing the existing plans that were endorsed with, uh, I suppose, updated versions, uh, and a revision to condition uh, 96 to add additional clarity surrounding the uh, construction stand standard of the acoustic fence. The recommended condition set, as, uh, as originally done by real planning, remains the same. 
um, and there's been no change in that regard. Uh, so thank you for that, and I guess I'll see if there's any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. To the councillors, um, Councillor Shine and yeah, Councillor no. Carroll. Okay. No, thanks, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Richard, for your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if um, um, you could go to uh, page 35 of board books, uh, which is towards the end of the officer's uh, presentation under internal referrals. Councillor Kerry, can you just, for Kirsten's benefit, can you just give the page number of the actual report as well? Yeah, sure. It's page 30 of 57. Yep, yep, I think we're there. Yep, internal okay. referrals, yep. Okay, under internal referral partner, it goes down to, uh, if you go down to regional architecture and heritage services design and development, uh, raise concerns regarding proposed built form. These matters have been considered in the assessment of this report. Can you tell us uh, what uh, those concerns were that were raised by the regional architecture and heritage services council officers? Uh, yeah, well, I suppose the issue with that is the report that's presented today is largely a reflection of that original report recommended by Real, uh, Real, Real Planning. Um, but what I will say is that uh, when the presentation was originally done and when they've discussed uh, those matters, it's, it's my understanding the main uh, concern they have was, is how the actual development addresses the street and how it actually relates to, I suppose, uh, pedestrian access and those sorts of things. Um, my understanding, uh, and as I say, I wasn't the assessment officer, uh, but my understanding is that uh, they've looked at these matters with regards to the scheme, and, and look, taking into account, obviously, it is, it's not a residential building, it's a commercial building, uh, that the built form itself is, I suppose, representative of a, uh, what you would, you know, you'd normally expect with a, uh, a, a, I suppose, a fast food outlet with a drive-through lane. Um, they've actually looked at the Ruffin Street frontage and it's been reduced in, in height and bulk from that, that, I suppose, from that direction simply because it is cut in. Um, but they've also gone uh, through, I suppose, information requests and getting to that final design point. They've actually allowed for a, I suppose, direct pedestrian access. Uh, I think it's even got a raised uh, crossing into the development to allow for that pedestrian connected, uh, you know, connection from the external street network and from uh, north... Uh, I'm going to say the wrong one, but North Point to the south. Um, just basically saying that if you are looking at, I suppose, a, a, a typical residential form development, whether it be a house or whether it be a, uh, I suppose, a unit development, the actual height and bulk of this structure is probably no worse than what you could have achieved if you'd done, I suppose, a unit development here. Um, and I suppose from a commercial uh, perspective, they've actually also included sort of landscaping as well as those uh, for a bit of bit of additional screening. They've also provided um, those footpaths into the development for wayfinding and just to ensure that it's not, I suppose, turning its back. The other thing to take into account is, is uh, you, you're probably not going to get a lot of foot, um, direct foot traffic from Ruffin Street, but certainly you would expect to uh, get a little bit of um, uh, foot traffic between, I suppose, North Point and uh, this, this proposal if it goes ahead. So uh, hopefully that addresses your concern, but unfortunately I wasn't the author. No, no, well, fair enough, but the, uh, I, I just would have assumed that coming from the uh, heritage and architectural services, it would have been the objection or the concern would have related to the, uh, to the um, uh, inconsistency of the proposed uh, development with uh, the it, houses that uh, are along, it, or the houses that it replaced. Yeah. That yeah. My understanding is, it's, as I say, it's not so much... It's not, certainly not heritage there, and it's, it's more to do with general architectural principles, taking into account the, the character of that street in that locality already has, I suppose, a mixed commercial residential feel. Um, so it's not strictly a residential, I suppose, comparison. It was more to do with just basically the interface uh, and the bulk and scale of the proposal. And uh, uh, I suppose the author of the report has concluded that uh, it's, it's no worse than what you may expect from an, an, another form of development there. If you could just go to the next uh, uh, item there, strategic planning and economic development, uh, they apparently also raised concerns regarding the consistency 
of the use with regard to current land zone and potential impact on the district centre. Uh, are you able to give us more details about what their concerns were in relation to the impact on the district centre? Uh, yeah, look, I suppose I can probably give, a, I suppose, an overview of what the applicant has... Uh, sorry, not the applicant, the actual consultant who prepared the report. I think the main thing to, to, to look at here is that um, our internal referral partners provide, I suppose, input uh, directly in relation to the zoning as it currently stands. Um, and that obviously has certain criteria attached to that. Um, what's happened in the assessment of this report is they've prepared an economic need to consider the actual, I suppose, what's in the centre, uh, capacity left within that centre itself, that's the North Point Centre, to, to accommodate additional food and drink outlets. And they've also looked at that, the impact of that food and drink outlet on those existing uses within that centre. And I guess he's concluded through that, he's used that as a relevant matter to say, well, it doesn't directly, um, it doesn't, whilst it's not directly in line with, I suppose, your, your direct, I suppose, residential zoning, uh, there is, I suppose, built into any scheme, as, and this scheme is uh, from 2012, uh, there is obviously room for growth of centres, uh, and the, the, fellow, the, the real planning who's prepared this report has taken into account, well, there has been a demonstrated economic need they've taken into account that the actual development's not going to impact on the viability of that centre. And they've also taken into account that, I suppose, the visual and the connection of this, uh, I suppose, this food and drink outlet to that centre is probably logical uh, in that it doesn't cross a, a higher order road uh, and it, it takes access from, a, I suppose, an, a, a local uh, road, that being, um, I've already forgotten the name of the road, but Jones, yes, Jones, Jones Street that you've already gotten on residential traffic going in and out of that. So yeah. I guess despite the, cons uh, the, 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 the apparent, I suppose, inconsistency at a higher level, uh, when you sort of nut down into the matters, there's been enough matters considered that have, that have informed the decision to basically go uh, towards the direction of saying, well, look, we think that there actually has been an economic need demonstrated here. It doesn't conflict with the, the actual higher, you know, the centre activity of that existing North Point Centre, uh, and that logically, if you were going to do an expansion of that centre, this is the site you'd do it. Yeah. So um, what, what you're saying is really the, um, the reply to the concerns that were raised, but they were raised, in fact, by strategic planning and economic development. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, just two, two, two other quick ones, if I might. I think you mentioned movement of general, or general motor vehicle movement, uh, and could concluding at 10 p.m., what you said earlier today. I could be wrong, but I think that you said... I thought this was a 24-hour access. So yeah. How my, does that gel? My apologies if, that, if I sort of made that... if I wasn't overly clear. Um, so Condition 89, uh, which I think is on page 18, if I've got the, the current one print out, um, it's basically limits, I suppose, or says that... The use is approved to operate for 24 hours per day, seven days a week. Um, however, uh, it only provides limitation in relation to your service vehicle movement, so that's your delivery of, you know, foodstuffs and all the rest of it. Yeah. And we've limited that to between 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yeah. Uh, and the other one we've limited is the, the I suppose, your refuse uh, collection between the hours of 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. But the use itself would operate 24-7. Uh, uh, and that's supported through that acoustic report that's been provided and supplied with the application to, to yeah. say that, look, the, the actual, uh, I suppose, acoustic outputs from the development are not going to conflict with the uh, planning scheme requirements. In their opinion. The, um, uh, but just to clear, uh, the ordinary members of the public driving their car can... Go oh, absolutely. In, yeah, it's open to the public for cars. Hours yep, day, absolutely. 24 hours a day. Yep. Uh, and finally... Um, just in relation to training, I'm just trying to envisage that land slopes from east to west uh, and the retaining wall. Um, I know, I think there is an indentation in the concrete or whatever to try and encourage the water, in my language, to go out to Jones Street be yep. before it goes down further towards Wattle Street uh, or the house at Wattle Street. And the retaining water, I suppose, tries to catch whatever water overflows that drain. Yeah. Is, so is that normal? Yeah, so basically uh, the, the, 
the idea of the site is, um, look, I guess in an ideal situation you'd have a site that drains to a, to a street and dry, drains to a, I guess, to a stormwater pit. Yeah. Um, most cases, however, you've got to do a little bit of cut and fill. Um, the point of those diagrams is simply to show that, uh, I suppose that south eastern corner, the corner of Jones and Ruffin Street, is probably one of the higher points, and that naturally water would currently uh, sheet flow down to that, I suppose, that northwestern corner, which is yep. the sort of the rear uh, corner of 20, about 28 Wattle Street, I think, the adjoining property. So what they've simply done is they've said, well, look, we've investigated putting easements through those adjoining properties. Um, but obviously due to existing infrastructure, and of course, I guess, and I don't wish to speak out to possibly commercial decisions as well, they've decided that they can deal with it uh, on site, and they're showing basically a situation where they've filled that northwestern corner of the site, which has required those retaining walls to be built, and that they've shown through their engineering diagrams that they can actually get the stormwater through a pipe system out to Council's drainage network in a compliant manner. Uh, but I guess the comment was simply made that in the event, uh, which could occur, but it's probably unlikely, that the drains on site do block, they basically uh, formed the land such that sheet flowing over that land from the car parking would flow through the site and then out the actual access onto Jones Street and then into the existing, I suppose, curb and channel on Jones Street. So that effectively you'd be re-diverting, um, if the drain was blocked, you're not going to basically have stormwater sheeting over the retaining walls into the adjoining uh, properties. It's sort of, uh, on the face of it, it's inconsistent with our concern about uh, hatchet blocks and, and you know, requirement for easements, et cetera, I would have thought. But uh, you're saying that because it's built up, uh, even though it's um, lower down, the, the natural level is a lot lower, I would assume, um, yep. as, as you proceed west, uh, the building up will have the effect of uh, uh, the it, water going uphill <laughs> into uh, uh, Jones Street, well, is that right? Yeah, I guess, I guess when you look at stormwater, we're looking at, uh, uh, I suppose, sheet flows and existing upstream uh, catchments. Uh, what McDonald's is effectively doing is this upstream catchment, they're effectively capturing all that sheet flow that would currently go through those lots. Yes, they've converted it to hard stand, but they've basically effectively re-diverted uh, it to ensure that it goes out into Jones Street. You'll, you'll not get an actual worsening on any of those properties downstream. So all the properties facing Waddle Street will actually not have a worsening as a result because they've ultimately put a bit of fill in there to capture that sheet flow to ensure you don't get a worsening um, for that very purpose. And yes, it, it did result in retaining walls and fences, but the overshadowing and overall heights within, is within acceptable limits. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Councillor Kerry. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I take councillors to page 39 of 57 down the bottom, the purpose of the code. The purpose of the low, medium density residential zone is to provide for a range and mix of dwelling. You've got it there. Uh, and then over here it says that, um, you know, the small scale services that will cater for local residents and the wider Will, and will not undermine. So then in the code it says that where it should be um, childcare centres, clubs, community centres, community use, education facilities, I suggest that if there's going to be considered as local use and servicing the local area, there should not be a 24-hour uh, opening of this facility. And I suggest that through the night that that's way overkill and we're trying to find a way to have... I'm concerned of the impacts on those residents that are there, the largest, biggest expense most people have is buying their home. Now, you have something like this put beside you, fine, but I don't believe it should be 24 hours a day. And if you read those conditions there, if it's predominantly considered on the fact that it's servicing the local community, then the local community wouldn't need it to be there 24 hours a day. So in, in that, I do not agree with a 24-hour day in that local community because there are residential houses through there. So I'm looking at that, and for me, and I've read right through it, for me, local use is local use, so it does not... A, a, a business of this scale, despite the fact that we're saying that it can be approved because it's servicing the local community, I don't believe 24 hours a day is, con is considered uh, servicing the local community. So I, on that, I, uh, I would um, propose a support of closing this... At, 10, 11 or whatever, perhaps on weekends, but I don't believe that if you're going to point that as being one of the reasons 
you want to uh, uh, prove it, uh, the local community does not demand that it be there 24 hours a day. I guess that's a comment, Councillor Carroll. A, a question on the, on, on the Mr. back... Mr Chair, it's not a comment. I'm asking, actually, and no. I probably didn't frame it well, why are we considering 24 hours a day when we've had submitters, there's concerns about noise, there's concerns about people driving through with their radios really loud at one o'clock in the morning? Um, why are we even considering 24 hours a day? I'm going to allow the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, once again, I'll just put the disclaimer in. Once again, I didn't wasn't the author of the report, um, but I will say that uh, yes, obviously there are requirements in a uh, residential uh, zone that talk about servicing the local community. They they do generally talk about hours of operation and those sorts of things, um, but that doesn't exclude the ability, I suppose, of a, a proponent to basically put an application in to to change those requirements. And I guess being a performance based planning scheme. Uh, there's nothing in there to suggest that, they, that, that there's anything here that, from a noise perspective or an amenity perspective, that is considering, you know, that, that the applicant has uh, is sort of, I suppose, demonstrated that there's nothing in here to, to warrant um, the author of this report to, to consider limiting the hours uh, to less than the 24-7 that they've done. Um, and I guess that also takes into account the, the environment that you're in there. Uh, you're on a higher order road, which is quite busy. Um, you've also got the existing North Point Centre as well, which would have, um, albeit there are some hours of operation in that, I believe, in that approval, but there would be noise emanating th um, from that throughout the night. There's also a high degree of light uh, spill in that area from the actual uh, road network as well. Um, so all things considered, um, I would say that the, uh, the original author has taken these sorts of matters into effect, and I'm not trying to put words into their mouth because I'm not the author, um, but I would suggest that uh, there is, I suppose, all things considered, they've taken, a, I suppose, a weighted approach and decided that uh, there's nothing here to suggest that a 24-hour operation would uh, negatively um, impact on the adjoining uh, residential uses above and beyond what the uh, planning scheme requirements allow. So if I can follow that up, Mr Chair, I'd like to know what actually is in the shopping centre that goes 24 hours a day. I don't believe there's anything. And I also think that there's a road division between the shopping centre and this site, and the shopping centre doesn't butt up to residences where people are trying to sleep. And when you buy a home and it's in a particular zoning, you expect for that to stay that way until at least a new planning scheme comes in. So I'm happy to consider this, but not at 24 hours. And I believe that the, the reason it's been put in here, saying it services the local community, I'd actually like to know I don't believe there's anything there's 24 hours over in the shopping centre. Be in, bear in mind that there's a road between the two sites. Mm -hmm. And don't bring up the highway to me because many people live on a highway through Toowoomba. There is residential along highways everywhere and you've got the opportunity to double glaze your windows and plant stuff in there, but not when something comes dropping in beside you and you uh, don't expect that to happen. So yeah. just... Before the, well, Councillor Nancy's got a question, Councillor Nancy, just before I go to that, uh, unless it's the same topic, I do have a question about the, the, what defines local community in the current planning scheme. Is it within 800 metres walking distance? Um, what, is, what is local community? Uh, councillors, that isn't a term that's defined uh, in the scheme and it's an interesting um, consideration. Uh, it was actually something, and this was a very long time ago, that was considered in the appeal that some councillors were here for that we had in relation to the Coho Street development where you'll note there's a McDonald's and a KFC, so it's exactly the same type of situation where there were... Um, fast food outlets and other food, food outlets proposed on a site that was actually zoned residential. Um, my understanding is, I can't speak for the KFC, but I think the McDonald's on that Eastville, they call it Eastville site, is actually 24 hours from... Yes, there's a house... Um, no, there's a house adjacent. Sorry, I lived this appeal. There's the... Um, Residentially, I don't know if it's the units or the the, the motelli place, which is abutting the drive-through for the KFC, and then behind the um, 
other food outlets that aren't drive through, there was actually a dwelling house um, directly adjacent. Um, there was consideration in that because one of the, it was a submitter appeal and one of the questions there was in relation to um, servicing a local need. Um, and actually the court's interpretation of um, what a local need actually meant was probably far wider than we probably anticipated would be the court's finding. I can't remember the exact detail, but the contention from the submitter was that it should be just, you know, you, you're living in, you know, a, I guess a primary catchment surrounding that development, but the court said no, it didn't just need to be um, confined to a specific identified catchment, that it could be a bit wider than that because naturally with any development, you know, if someone happens to be driving past, then they're potentially going to want to access that development. So from recollection, the actual interpretation of what was meant by local was probably wider than you would um, in the normal terms think was meant by that. If I could have a follow-up, the motel's across the Coho Street. It's over the other side of the road, and there's houses no, on the... No, there's a, there's a development... That, that belongs to the Cancer Council. That was a motel, but it's... Yeah, that's directly yeah. adjacent. So that's Olive McMahon, and, and, yep. yeah, and there's, there's actually service rooms before. The residential part of it doesn't abut mm -hmm. that. It's up the other mm -hmm. end. So it's uh, quite a different scenario for me. I'm very aware of that because I'm patron of Relay for Life and I've been in there many times and the, and the dining room is abutting that there, not the, not the residential. And up the other end, there's uh, the, the houses and that there are used for services, not for, not for uh, residential. So I think it's quite different. Okay. No, so there is a house adjacent. So GM on this topic and then I'll yeah. go to Councillor Nancy. Yeah. Just, just very quickly. Um, it, it, yeah, we're talking about amenity when we're talking about what you're talking about in terms of the hours that the development would be open to the public. And from an amenity viewpoint, it is certainly legitimate to be looking to put a uh, lim limitation on the hours. Um, I, I think the limitation on the hours has got little to do with whether it's servicing a local need or a sub-regional or a regional need or a national need. Um, but certainly from an amenity viewpoint, if the councils felt that this would be an additional safeguard in terms of the local people that still live there. Um, it's a legitimate thing to, uh, to put a condition on in regard to. So I just wanted to add that. I think there's a confusion here between local and, and, and the hours of operation. Thank you. My point is that if I'm trying to sleep and a car goes past with a radio which nobody's got in control about, uh, and you're woken up, and that could happen three or four times a night. I don't think that that's fair to the residents. Thanks, Councillor Carroll. Thank you, uh, Danielle. Um, Councillor Nancy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Richard. I've got a few questions, so please bear with me. Um, you'll recall at the at the uh, previous meeting, I was quite outspoken about the design, um, which is. You know, it's still exactly the same de design, which shows no respect for the neighbours, in my view. I don't think there's been any consideration given to the neighbours around the, um, the design of, of the site. Um, and that comes down to the noise criteria. Um, when I look at the maps showing the acoustics results, it just doesn't seem to add up to me to what's been put in the table. But also, have they considered... Um, as Councillor Carroll said, music playing, um, doors slamming or cars restarting. Has that all been considered in the acoustics? And those two receptors that are in that driveway, which is right against the fence, which is probably right against the bedroom of the next door house, how insulting. Um, those two receptors in those driveways, they're either on top of or under a roof. And I just wondered how that was measured. Uh, because whichever way they are, it's a, it'd be a different outcome. Um, and I notice in the results that the day noise is higher than the night noise, which I found very interesting because I know out at Ackland Mine, the night noise is higher than the day noise. So I found that very interesting. Um, I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Oh, I might just... Do you want to come up, Luke? I might get attachment three brought up because there may be some, I suppose the attachment three has the, uh, the revised noise modelling uh, 
over to, uh, shadow and noise diagrams in it, but I'll pass it over to Luke. Actually, if you just, uh, good afternoon, councillors, chair. Hi. Could you scroll up one page, please, to the table? So, reiterating the noise monitoring that was completed as part of the original assessment, you're looking at Sorry, that's the, uh, the monitoring that was done as a result of the work. I apologise. Um, the background noise monitoring which set the limit for that was a very, very flat um, amount of noise from a day, evening and night time period. The daytime noise was 43 decibels and the nighttime noise was 44 decibels. So when you are looking at condition 92, of the decision notice as recommended. The planning scheme, uh, P08, requires that applications meet a background plus criteria for day and evening of plus five and for night a plus three. So when we have in our uh, condition 92 table that day and evening are set at 48 decibels for variable noise, 43 decibels plus five, 48 decibels and then at night, 44 decibels plus 3 decibels. So in terms of your question when you were saying about the, the noise levels, it speaks to the area in that there's a relatively high amount of noise in the existing environment without this development. 44 decibels is not quiet from a residential point of view. And then from that is what they base their assessment off their modelling presents, is it below those limits that the planning scheme requires them to meet? And yes, it was. So that was one of your questions, which I've hopefully answered. Would you like to please remind me of your other questions and I'll try and answer them. So, Hi. So the, um, um, were the people playing music in their vehicle when they come through? Um, car door slamming? Car door slamming was... Vehicle noise was, patron noise was. But not music. No. Um, and Can't car, control car that. Restarts. Partly car restarts. That is considered based off the vehicle type and how much noise it is actually emitting. Modern day cars um, are more so producing a very flat noise level, meaning that the engine noise at travelling at a particular speed is a certain point and the restart noise is no louder. And so the modelling that is done is, was done was for a full peak loading of the drive-through and the two lanes of the drive-through, meaning two vehicles stopped stationary, emitting a noise level commensurate to that particular speed as if they were passing through. We checked that. That noise level would have been about 70 decibels, which is not also a, a quiet noise level for vehicles running through them. In terms of then having car stereos, et cetera, et cetera, running, um, that's a variable which is a very, very difficult thing to try and get people to assess, obviously. There very well may be someone that has a stereo slightly louder. They roll their render down, they go to order, and then there's a little bit where all of a sudden no one can hear, the operator can't hear, the stereo is turned off while they're waiting in line and placing an order. Yeah, so we really don't know, do we? Um, and then the receptors, whether they were under or on top of the roof of the um, shelters in the drive-through. Whether the receptors... The, where the, the sources, where they are measuring the noise. Uh, based off the designs that were submitted, so the AutoCAD model that shows the location of everything in, in space, spatially, that plus the topography is included within the model itself. So where the drive-through lanes are, and if there is an overhang, for example, then that would be included in the model. So, Councillor Nancy, I'm not sure whether you, you've interpreted that right. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying, do you mean, was it considered that the noise from inside the resident's house, what the noise level would be there at that point or not? Um, from the resident sitting in, oh, 
in their bedroom or watching TV? Is that well, that's that's a very valid question to ask. The, it wasn't okay, my sorry, question, I'm... but it's a valid one. I thought that's what you meant. Sorry. Sure. No. These these noise models are assessed with noise on the outside of the house, so they're external criteria. Yeah. That they have to meet, and therefore, then when you're sitting inside a residence or sleeping, there is an element of noise loss, typically 7 dB, um, for older homes or homes that might have a, an open window, because it's not the full um, facade that gets affected, it's only partial amount of window, about a 7 decibel loss. So we have a noise criteria of 47 decibels um, to be achieved at that particular residence. Effectively, inside the residence, it would be closer to 40. Okay. And that would be a conservative estimate. Most houses you experience quite a lot more than 7 dB transmission loss through walls and windows. Thank you. So then in relation to the fence line, um, I just wondered, um, thinking about the neighbours again, the, the new fence line is built, this big uh, noise barrier goes up. And what happens on their side of the fence? Is their, fences, is their fence removed and all that tidied up? Or, because I don't think that's been detailed in here, has it? Um, might just have a quick look. Usually we do have conditions relating to um, removing uh, fencing where it does run a line, it runs in an alignment with an existing fence. So I'm, I'm hoping we have that condition in here, but uh, I will have a quick, quick look. If we don't, we don't. With regards to that, we could certainly insert it if it's not here, and I can't see it off the top of my head. But basically, um, we're replacing, or I suppose we're running a new fence parallel to an existing fence. We often ask for the existing fence to be removed and the new fencing to be basically born, uh, constructed by the uh, developer and the cost borne by the developer. Um, so if we haven't got that, we could, that could be a condition to be included, quite reasonably. That would be good, but I'd also... <laughs> What I'd really like to see is for those poor people that have now got this big um, barrier fence uh, to look at that actually greenery was planted for them as well. But, but that aside, um, the landscaping, I couldn't really find anything in here on landscaping, but maybe it is there and I just didn't find it. But um, all the way around the, this acoustics fence, um, will there be plantings? There to is. It. Sorry. Yeah, so condition 108, I guess um, with regards to that, there'll be a little bit, I suppose, to answer the question of um, the rear western neighbours, because obviously the, the acoustic fence is going to be set up on a second tier. There will actually be a small amount for the ones on Waddle Street. Um, there'll be a small amount of, I suppose, landscaping area on their side of the acoustic fence to basically soften that, and there's an access gate included so that uh, the people maintaining the gardens uh, for McDonald's would maintain that as well as the landscaping within the site. Where the fence is hard up against the boundary, there isn't any provision for landscaping because unfortunately that doesn't form part of the subject site. Um, but I guess what I will say in relation to that is the northern properties, uh, probably uh, the impact on it is probably somewhat limited to the extent that a lot of that section is actually going into cuts. So the actual fence or the acoustic fence that they're providing along there is, I suppose, at ground level to the neighbouring side. And then as you get to the rear of the property towards the west, it does actually then go up on a bit of a retaining wall height uh, from that point. And then, of course, when you look at the uh, properties to the, uh, to the west, where there is obviously the terracing of the retaining wall, and uh, there's also some retaining wall and fence on the boundary, uh, those locations, for the most part, actually have sheds and other structures, which I suppose already screen that fencing to a certain extent. Um, but it, I guess it doesn't prohibit the adjoining landowner from putting landscaping in, but ultimately as it is 
uh, an adjoining site uh, and it's not part of this application, it's not possible to put conditioning uh, landscaping requirements outside of the subject site. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I think you might have misunderstood. I, I flowed on from that and was talking about landscaping on site. And the main area I'm thinking, apart from making it a nice, and McDonald's do generally have their gardens very nice, mm -hmm. but on that northern wall where that acoustics, where the driveway is, mm -hmm. the only thing I could see was concrete on between, so you know, right. from the wall to the dr actual driveway. And I, I really think that shrubs along there would help also soften that I think noise. It might be an attachment 11, perhaps, if we could find that. That may have an actual. Sorry to. Going through plans. So if we just zoom out a little bit, I'll go to that top, the, the previous. Yep. Uh, so basically, most of that hatching is landscaping areas. Um, so uh, I can't, from this scale, tell the width of those areas, but uh, the, the, I suppose the applicant has proposed to put landscaping of sorts all around the, uh, the, the internal uh, perimeter of the site. And obviously that will vary depending on the width of the garden as to how high it will get. Uh, but certainly in the uh, wider spaces, you'd expect them, and they would, and have been conditioned to do so, uh, to put larger shrubs and then obviously where you've got situations where it's a narrower section, uh, the plantings would be somewhat smaller and would provide more of a screening element to the actual McDonald's site and potentially really have no impact, I suppose, on the adjoining neighbours. But they certainly have put uh, the expected amount of landscaping you would normally see on a commercial development around the site. Okay, thank you. Um, and then pedestrian access on Jones Street, mm -hmm. on the northern side of Jones Street. Have we catered for that all the way along? Yeah, so basically uh, you've got that existing, uh, I suppose, verge uh, um, just to the bottom of this. So you've got obviously Joan Street there. Um, my understanding is that, yes, you would basically, you can see in the, sorry. Oh. Um, <laughs> you can basically see that, that they've got a, a footpath along that frontage. And then obviously you've got the little uh, connection point into the raised crossing. Um, into the actual development itself. So in terms of pedestrian access, it comes off Ruffin Street, down Jones Street, and then into the site. And for people coming from, um, what's that street at the back there, the western side, what's that street? Uh, Wattle Street. Yeah, when, if they Unfor come around. Yeah, unfortunately, because there's that property between Wattle Street, it doesn't form the frontage of the site, so it's difficult to condition a footpath on a local street where it doesn't actually abut the site. But ultimately, you do also have a footpath uh, on the southern side of Jones Street, uh, which does extend the full length of the um, North Point development as well. So okay. they've, they've still got, I suppose, reasonable access to the site. All right, thank you. So just going back to, I'm on my last one. Thanks for your patience. Um, just going back to what Councillor Carroll raised before in relation to servicing the day-to-day -day convenience needs of the immediate local residents, which is what the current zoning is. The other two bits that I have in relation to that is um, creating strip development or expanding an existing centre. Mm -hmm. And you've got Jones Street, as Councillor Carroll rightly pointed out, that's your cut-off point from that centre. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder how that's really being addressed. And also, um, sorry, I'm having trouble reading my writing. I can't write real well at the moment. Located on land with direct access to a distributor, um, sub-arterial or regional arterial road. Mm -hmm. That's the three things to me yep. that are conflicting with having that development there. Yeah, so I suppose uh, in answering that question, um, obviously um, Ruffin Street or the uh, New England Highway is obviously a state controlled road, so it's obviously a very high order road. Um, you would expect um, development would ultimately front that simply because it gets that high commercial exposure. The difficulty we face here is that obviously you've got Jones Street uh, directly comes off that and that is a local street. Um, main roads typically would restrict if not prohibit access where you can get access to a, uh, a direct access to their asset when you can get access off a, uh, I suppose, a, a local street or a secondary street which is not under their control. Um, what I suppose works in the favour here is that Jones Street already is, I suppose, I think it's the third, might be, uh, it, well, it's the northern access point, I suppose, to the North Point Shopping Centre. Yeah. And you've got a unique situation where you've got an actual set of lights 
and traffic that is generated from this development doesn't actually go any further into the residential area. So it basically turns either into North, well, commercial development either turns into North Point, turns into Aldi further down, or it turns into potentially if this development is approved into, um, uh, I suppose, the McDonald's. Um, with regards to that, obviously the amenity on that road, um, it's already a compromised amenity. Uh, and this development, I suppose, doesn't actually worsen that situation, particularly if you remove the residential component uh, from that northern side. With regards to strip development, I guess uh, it's all, I suppose, from the perspective of the person looking at it. Um, I suppose you can't consider it to be strip development, but you could also consider it to be a logical expansion to an existing centre that's already reached its, I suppose, capacity. As I alluded to before, and I'm not speaking about a future planning scheme, and I make no uh, suggestion that you would be looking at expanding it, but if uh, you do get a need for a development and there's no existing uh, land supply or there's inadequate land supply within that centre, and you are looking at expanding a centre, uh, this is probably the most logical place to do it. Um, but ultimately, you could see this as strip development, but also you could just see it as an expansion to the centre. Uh, thank you for that, and, and I hear you. But having said that, we also know there's a housing shortage as well, and so we've got to weigh up whether we need more shops or whether we need more houses. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Councillor Nancy. Uh, Councillor Tim. You. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, I, I do have a few questions. Most of them were fairly in line with Councillor Summerfield's, but uh, I will uh, briefly re-prosecute <laughs> just the idea of... Um, old matey who lives directly to the north of this. Mm -hmm. I've read attachment three, the additional acoustic information mm -hmm. extensively. I realise the expert report says the brick wall, that, or the wall that's gonna be built mm -hmm. will put the decibel level to an appropriate level. And I can see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. My concern is that's notwithstanding, there's uh, a 2.4 metre high wall um, being built on the boundary, and if you look at how close his house is to the boundary, mm -hmm. you know, is it close enough that you can touch this wall? Is that it's like if we reach out the window, here's a two point four metre wall? Yep. Has, has that come into your? Could you provide clarification on that, please? Yep, that's all right. Bear with us while we hopefully find the right uh, diagram here. Um, uh, so, no, you're right. So I'm thinking. I think it's attachment four. Yes. So I just want to try and get those cross sections. That's all I'm aiming for here, sorry. Well, attachment 10 shows you how close his house is to the red boundary uh, line. Yeah, I was just doing four just to see the actual wall height yes. based on the cross sections, but we can um, move. Oh, I've done the wrong one. I may well have. It's attachment three, uh, page 243 of board books. It says it's 2.4 metres outside those uh, the things where you order your Maccas, voice things. <laughs> Technical yep. name escapes me. Check the attachment. Oh. Over a few more. That one, there it is. So 2.4 metres, and he's touching it literally. Um, uh, have you got yeah. any more information that can assist me whether that we're, we're, apply, we're complying with everything, having that outside yeah. what, your southern room? Would we potentially maybe get the aerial view? I think that, as I 10. say, unfortunately I'm not 100% on the site, but it, hopefully attach, maybe attachment 10 if we could, because that may just give us yes. a bit of an insight as to the house. Yep. Can I ring someone so, else? Yep. So basically, yeah, you've got that house is fairly close uh, to the boundary. I, I acknowledge that. Um, but I guess, I suppose when you consider, I suppose, retaining wall heights and fencing, um, there's two points I'll make in relation to this. Uh, the first is that the house to the north uh, is actually in a section where it would be, I suppose, the drive through is in a, a small amount of cut. Uh, so the actual acoustic barrier, it's only going to be the height of the acoustic fence in that location and you would normally expect in a residential development you could get anywhere between a 1.8 to a 2 metre high fence. The only difference here is that it's, it's an acoustic fence so it'll be built to I suppose a certain quality and it won't have gaps in it. 
as you go further to the rear of the site, obviously there's going to be an increase in the amount of fill. Um, but once that starts to happen, you're getting into the open space uh, section. So I guess whilst I'm not the assessing officer, I would contend that the boundary has not moved as a result of this application. Uh, there's every right to have an existing 1.8 to 2 metre high fence uh, hard up against that boundary now and I, I don't think there's any difference in relation to that. And the only other remark I'll make is that obviously that house is to the north. So there is no overshadowing impact in relation yeah. to that. So the actual impact of that fence uh, is not going to have any implications in terms of access to sunlight. Um, <coughs> and I would say that this development does not change, uh, I suppose, the relative closeness of that fence to that house. And, and, and I don't believe it actually changes the, the ability to put a two metre high fence that you could potentially have there now. Okay, sure. So, he's, I mean, if that state is residential and his neighbours put a two metre high fence in, it could happen as is anyway. Good. And you're saying it, it may be cut in the McDonald's It, it is cut, and that's right. why I was going to attempt to go to the diagram, but uh, there's certainly an amount of cut there. And I, as I say, I, I could have sworn that it was, uh, but it's not attachment four, it might actually be... Yeah, I have read it. Yeah. Uh, maybe five. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so basically... It is in the set of attachment four. There's a couple of cross sections there, and it does show it does show cutting there. So I don't know if you want to go to that to actually ascertain the height at those sections, um, just to to confirm in one's uh, mind where it sits in relation to that. Should be four. It's attachment five. Oh, sorry, it is attachment five. That's why I keep sending you off on the... There it my is. apologies. Yes. So if you go up one, just to see what we've got, just the plan above, I just want to see which numbers we've got, unfortunately. Uh, if you can just zoom in up to the top boundary there, I just want to see the numbers of the letters on those cross sections. Hopefully I can see them. RL610. I can't read them. Okay, well scroll, scroll down to the second page and you'll see you've got cross sections A through B and you can see, I suppose there you go, cross section C. So cross section C there I believe shows, is it E? Yeah, I'm just trying to get basically the cross section showing the cutting of the drive through relative to the B. Let's just scroll up, sorry. Up. B, two, up, more. two more. Two more. <laughs> and then just, yeah, just go to the right. Yep. My apologies. As you can see there, you've got basically the, uh, it shows you the height of the, you've got the cutting there, and then you've got the boundary fence sitting on that. So okay. basically, you've got your, your, your cutting, uh, which is basically the drive-through, which sits below natural ground level currently, and then you've got your side fence sitting on top of that. Um, and that's, I suppose, what I'm talking about in relation to, uh, particularly with regards to the noise as well from that drive-through, that not only have you got the, you've got the cutting acting in your favour, you've also got the acoustic barrier sort of, I suppose, shielding that noise to a certain extent. Um, I don't know if that helps... With no, regards? I think it's it's a valid point. It's cut in, and then and then there could be a fence there anyway. But um, if Mark wanted to, is it four point four metres? It is the wrong. I can't. You're if you right. look, look if you I'll look. take your word for it. No, no, no. <laughs> My apologies. I can't see the diagram from here. But if it if through, you... through through the chair, if you're looking at the boundary what the cross-section cuts in regards to the boundary on the northern boundary. Yes, that's the one we the want. Cross-section E is about the closest that you have. E. OK, because cross-section F is right on, even though it runs across that side, it's right mm -hmm. along uh, Rutland Street. Yep. So. OK. Right, so it's not really cutting. Yeah, Confirm that's the position. It, section E doesn't actually show the acoustic wall only shows across across that way when you look at the plan. Yeah. <clears throat> I was of the understanding there was a small amount of cutting up at the drive-through, but I could be, I apologise if I'm wrong. 
No, on the plan, so if you go to the plan. Yep. One up. Yep. Yep. Cross, cross section E goes through, we look at the whole plan in the face. Cross section E runs north south through the middle of the site. You can see the E at the bottom. Okay, so that gives you the positioning of that cross section. Yep. Which is the only cross section that is representative to any degree of what that house to the north may experience because cross section F is running along. Yeah, the so you've got eastern you've got you've got cross section F which is sort of in the garden as well, but that doesn't show because they haven't got the cutting. Absolutely. But I guess what I would say is, um, whilst we haven't got a direct crossing, a cross section there, there is actually a degree of cut there, which I believe is shown through uh, cross section C, although that is to the Rutherford Street frontage. Um, there, obviously, that cutting would reduce in depth as it goes through along that northern boundary towards the west, but you're certainly still in cutting. And okay. unfortunately, the, the, the cross section I thought we had is wrong. <laughs> but it Thanks is cut. Thanks for that. We'll, um, we'll, we'll settle on it. Possibly small cut in. How about that? Um, next question, Chair, if I may. The low medium density residential zone, again, I know it's been prosecuted to death. I don't, I don't, I don't believe it fits the criteria of low medium density residential use. Um, you know, the, the, the intensity of it, the amenity of it, um, I appreciate the officers court interpretation of what local um, local use is and that it's far wider than we're perhaps expecting. But um, in reading the report, now I've lost my page going back, if it fails in the low medium residential zone, you're saying that doesn't actually matter because you're assessing it against the strategic framework anyway. Yep. And then in the report it says that the strategic framework can therefore assess it subject to a few conditions. So we don't need to assess it against the low to medium residential we, work, yeah. which it would fail. Yeah. We can again as, instead assess it against the strategic framework. Is yeah. that correct? We, look, I, I guess um, the idea behind that is ultimately you do have an underlying zone, which is residential. And obviously residential has a, I suppose, a small component in it that it talks about, I suppose, the, corner, the, the old corner shop and that sort of thing, which is where you get that sort of local centre thing from. Um, but at the end of the day, the way that the scheme works, and particularly given that it's impact accessible, is that uh, it, it basically caters for situations where you do have things outside of the norm, which is basically when a, a scheme evolves or a project is uh, put into an, or an application is made, um, we have to assess an application on its merits. And as a performance-based scheme, where it doesn't comply with the zone intent, you basically escalate it up. And that gets you up into the strategic framework. The other thing that also comes into play here is relevant matters, and that one of the relevant matters that the author of the, the report has taken into account is that economic needs as well, which has also informed the reason for the purpose behind having a residential, uh, sorry, a commercial development on this site. And then basically taking that into account, he's, I suppose, weighed that all up and taken those matters into account and formed the opinion that despite that, uh, I suppose, that conflict with the zone intent, that overall this development is, does not uh, offend the scheme to such an extent that you would you would warrant a refusal, that you would actually look at uh, the impact on the adjoining residents. And I guess through the reports that have been provided um, and the data that's been provided, uh, basically they're demonstrating that those that you know those impacts would be within reasonable limits. Um, so it really just comes down to amenity and aesthetics. The report also contends that the actual building style itself is commensurate with the area. Uh, that it doesn't offend the residential uh, area to, to, to that much of an extent that it would warrant a refusal. So I guess as a balancing exercise, uh, it, it's basically said, yes, there's a few things saying no, but there's a lot of things, I suppose, that you can weigh on the other hand or balance on the other hand, suggesting that there's you know, greater weight has been taken to that to support the proposal. I suppose that's probably the best explanation I can give, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well covered. Um, I appreciate that, Chair. May I have one more quick question? Um, Concerning the social impact, I'm not concerned that we around this chamber need to be another Maccas. I'm concerned that's not our business. We're not here to look at... And, you know, when the community says, 
Would you put another service station there for? That's certainly not our question to ask. Mm -hmm. We're looking at if the premises complies with the planning scheme. But concerning the amenity and the fact that there's a school across the road from the new proposed McDonald's, keeping in mind that they have access to half a dozen other fast food outlets in North Point right next door anyway, um, is that does that have any impact on our decision it's, here today? It's not um, really, yeah. The, the, I suppose the diet choices of individuals is not a consideration that's a planning matter that I can take into account now. Yeah, look, sure. If I'm standing, if I Google map it and I'm standing in the admin building of Harlexton State School, I can see the golden arches from there. It's pretty damn good marketing. <laughs> um, and and we, can I be advised if we can take that into account uh, in this planning? All I can say is from a planning perspective, it's not a matter that we can give consideration to, no. Thank you. No more questions, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Tim. Before I go to you, Councillor Kerry, just on that, um, I have a question. Uh, uh, Richard, um, there's been reference made about... <coughs> oh, Councillor Tim. Um, there's been reference made to potential for strip development. Um, whilst the, we're considering the individual application here, the consequences of collective impacts of potential strip development encroaching across what you would probably see as a natural boundary to a, to a centre, which is Jones Street. Once it's hopped the road, there's potential for the collective impacts, i.e. amenity, to be affected, not just for Harlexton School, but further up as it continues. We've got Downlands College, we've got another uh, um, the best way I can put this appropriately is some, uh, an at-risk community on the same side to the north, a facility there that uh, uh, houses um, uh, people in need. Um, so I get it that it's a planning matter, mm -hmm. but I, I guess my question is where... Do we have any consideration for for this? There is there is the natural progression. Um, there's also been mention of properties being sterilised. In other words, the adjoining residents are pretty much um, uh, limited as to their future options. Probably uh, sale to a potential investor for a further commercial development further north, and so on, and so on. That's what concerns me, mm. I must say. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I guess that's a... I don't expect you to answer No, I was going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Councillor Shine, Kerry. Yeah, no, just uh, briefly, uh, because uh, Councillor McMahon raised the point that I was going to, uh, where I'm aware, and I'm sure all councillors are aware, of uh, the uh, views of health professionals in Toowoomba and uh, many citizens concerned about the health risks uh, flowing on since the late 70s and, and 80s in uh, Toowoomba with the proliferation of fast food outlets. And the question will be raised, uh, what, you know, why, why has Council allowed it if we do allow this to go ahead? Um, and Richard, you confirmed that uh, by law under the Planning Act, the council has no power to uh, reject an application based on health uh, uh, aspects, I think. Um, and uh, one assumes the only way we can get over that is uh, one way to proceed would be for council at the LGA conference later in the year to propose uh, for the LGA to lobby the government to propose an amendment to the health regulations to, to allow, uh, or this act, the planning act, to allow um, uh, that uh, ground, uh, health or social impacts, to be included as a ground for objection. Uh, uh, as I say, I can't really <laughs> answer that. I might take that one on. Um, yep, it's a legal product. Um, and I think whether it is a healthy food or not is not for myself or any other planner to determine. Um, 
and it's a land use consideration. You could have any, I mean, this particular use appears to be a McDonald's, but it could be any food outlet. And uh, I think the very important consideration is that that cannot be a consideration when we're looking at a land use application. The only consideration I guess we could make is, is it a, um, a legal product um, in the state of Queensland? Is it a legal product that can be retailed, can be produced and, and manufactured and sold to the public? And to, to my understanding at this point, there is no issue with it being illegal or unlawful to sell uh, fast food in Queensland. So we need to deal with this as a legitimate food outlet for the public the local public as well as the travelling public and that it is a question of a land use which brings into question all the issues that we've been talking about, the amenity issues, the um, traffic impact issues, the aesthetic issues, the acoustic issues. They're the matters that we need to consider when looking at this application. We shouldn't be looking at whether the product that it's actually selling is healthy for Mrs Jones or Mrs Smith or not, or whether we should be telling Mrs Jones and Mrs Smith what they should be eating, yeah. um, it's definitely not part of this exercise. No, well, thank you. It sort of confirms what I was saying. I think that the Act would need to be amended in order for those considerations to be taken into account. Do you really think you get the state across on that line? <laughs> well. I'd be reasonably look. This this city has the worst reputation if, in the state, if not the Commonwealth, for obesity. I think it's, you know, part of the reason why all of us were elected was to improve um, the outcomes in all respects for our citizens. And I think if uh, if we have no chance of uh, of changing the law in that regard, it'll be very very disappointing. Thanks, Councillor Kerry. Councillor Jeff? Can yeah. I make a comment on that? Oh, yep. Sorry, Chair. To same, same subject, yep. It is the yep. same subject. Just while the General Manager is talking and noted, um, you know, we'll assess this on the land use, not the product. We are looking at a new planning scheme as of now, and I've had already preliminary conversations in what councillors may like to see in that, and things like clumping of fast food outlets deliberately placed. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, in areas where they know there's no supermarket and the, the residents shop there, is that something that, like, you can have a short answer that we can uh, look at in our new planning scheme as a region? So, so I think I understand your question. You're saying can we, in our new planning scheme, control um, uses that, such as vendors for fast food? Is that what you're or, saying? where they clump or where they may hypothetically put in lower socioeconomic areas, those well, kind I of mean, questions? That's, what is a lower socioeconomic yeah, okay. area? I mean, um, and areas change. Um, what's a, a, a rundown area that's older and uh, maybe um, somewhat um, lower in value in terms of real estate? can change next week. Yeah. Um, no, look, I'll, I'll leave so it. I it's just... very difficult. The, the assessment, I guess, what I'm saying is, as far as I know, there's only one product that's prohibited in Queensland, and that, that's uh, adult bookshops, in yeah. quotation look, marks. We're, and, get, we're getting a bit off track here. Yeah, we Mr. are. Chair. I and apologise, Chair. I wasn't saying look, this one. I was saying hypothetically let's, low socioeconomic. Let's, uh, I'll leave I, it. I think it's very difficult. I, hang on. I think the lead would come from the state government, if the state government wanted hang to Hang on, control. Mr GM. Let's mm. get back on track here. Look. The, I, I'll, I, my undertaking, Councillor Tim, is in, as part of the portfolio that that should be on the list as far as consideration for the new planning scheme and, and it comes back to land use and the suitability and uh, the locations and you're talking about cluster type developments. That's why fast food uh, outlets deliberately cluster because people want choice when they pull up in their motor vehicle traveling, traveling through. 
So yes, it's a reasonable request and I would like the GM to take that on board uh, as, as a consideration in our deliberations because it'll be, it'll be a long journey, that one. Um, Councillor Jeff, sorry. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for bringing us back on track uh, a little bit there. Um, through you to, to Richard. Richard, two questions for you, if I could. The first one is just clarification around the, the um, question from Councillor Summerfield in regard to the, the fencing and uh, for, the, for the neighbouring properties. Mm -hmm. is, it, um, is it the understanding that if there's nothing in as a condition, that the developer or the applicant can't build a parallel fence uh, without approval? And if there is a fence to be erected, which there is in this case, um, the other fence needs to be removed at the applicant's expense. There's no condition in here, so that would be my assumption. Yeah. So the general, I suppose the general approach we take is obviously with, with an approval, and this one's clearly got an acoustic fence, uh, there would normally need to be some sort of, I suppose, agreement. With, if, it's, if it's on the fence line, you would normally have to agree with your neighbour to remove a fence anyway. Um, I suppose the intent of the condition is, if it is, was put in there, is to simply say we don't want uh, fences which are in a parallel alignment, I guess to suppose, uh, force home the fact that we just want the one singular fence. There's benefit to both, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to both because ultimately, um, I guess at the end of the day, if it is on the, on the property boundary, uh, the fence would have to be removed and you would have to basically get some form of agreement with the neighbour to do so um, and build that acoustic fence. So if the fence, however, was surveyed and found to be within the property boundary, completely within the adjoining neighbour, that's their asset, that's, that's up to them. They're, they're, it's their decision as to whether or not you can pull it down. So there are pros and cons to that condition. Uh, it's more, the intent of it is more to just provide clarity to the very situation we're talking about, to sort of give guidance to say that, well, we'd rather see one singular fence as opposed to two, but at the end of the day, if the owner of the fence on the adjoining property uh, wishes to keep their fence and it is within the confines of their boundary, there's, there's nothing uh, preventing them from keeping it. Um, I, I hope that answers the question. Perhaps it does, perhaps it doesn't. No, it does answer the question. So perhaps there should be a, a condition in there um, whereby the applicant must uh, negotiate with the, the owner in regard to uh, the owner of the adjoining property or the neighbouring property really has that choice as to whether they have to demolish the fence or not. I don't think the best outcome is parallel fencing. No, it's, it's not. But I suppose equally you could also argue the, the applicant could then choose to put the, the acoustic fence completely within their boundary as well. So Agreed. It doesn't 100% it doesn't get rid of the issue at hand. OK, suppose, so but if, the, if the plan is that it is on the boundary... Sorry, Stuart. So it, it is a standard condition? It's a, it's a condition within the standard set, but it sure. doesn't mean it's always used, no. OK. And I guess the author of the report has chosen not to in this instance. OK, so... But, but I, we can, I, obviously we can put it in, but it doesn't necessarily alleviate, um, I suppose, civil issues between two neighbours. That's fine. I, I don't know, I'd, I'd feel comfortable, if it, more comfortable if it was in there just to yep, get some fine. clarity for, for both. The second question for you, Richard, and... If, you like, if I can, Chair, I'd like to ask the applicant a question. Um, in regard to the passage of time from when this first came to now, and there's obviously other reports through attachments that have been brought to light as a result of that, are there any changes from the initial application um, from the applicant from then to now, substantive or, or any other minor changes that have been brought to light? I think what they've attempted to do through these drawings is basically they've had additional survey data. So when those uh, cross sections were prepared, they are very similar to the last lot, but they've actually got the accurate, the accurate details to actually confirm those heights and those cross sections. In terms of the layout, it's very much the same, if not the same as what it was, but I dare say there might just be some additional clarification regarding you know, final building heights and that sort of thing. Sure, thank you, no, that's great. Could I, could I ask the... Applicant, a couple of questions, maybe yes. Mr and, uh, Collier or something? Yeah, a technical one? Or I... uh, well, um, probably an herbist question in regard to one question, so I can ask, ask it first to Cameron. Yeah, Cameron and, uh, and Ryan, if you could both come up, please. Thanks, gents. 
<coughs> First question might cross over on both, Chair, but I think if we'll start with, with uh, Cameron, if I could. Uh, so, Cameron, you're from Urbis. So That's correct. You're yes. Urbis, thank you. Um, Cameron, just in regard to the layout of the site and where it's positioned, um, and obviously you know, it needs good street frontage for, for the operator's perspective, just from your opinion as, as a designer, um, and keeping in mind what you've heard today about amenity for neighbours and what have you, is that layout in any way um, being able to change or would it be to the detriment of a planning design? Through you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, look, what I'd say is the operational requirements of the McDonald's re re restaurant is, is fairly specific um, in terms of internal layout, in terms of the way it addresses the street, pedestrian um, connectivity and things like that. So in looking at a site like this, there's very little room to manoeuvre in terms of actually orientating the building in a different way. You've obviously got three active frontages, if you like, if not four, in terms of ordering, payment, collection, and then pedestrian access. Uh, and really on a site like this, uh, you know, it would be very early days that we would have come to the conclusion that this is the only logical um, layout for this restaurant. Thank you, that's fine. So that's all I've got for Cameron. Others might have questions for them. Um, Ryan, that's right, Ryan. Ryan, just uh, in regard to the operating hours and noting that uh, North Point advertised from 9 till 5.30, and there's some that might be just over that time. We've got you know, half a dozen McDonald's already operating in town, most of which are 24 hours. Two that are in shopping centres are either the shopping centre hours, 8.30 to 5.30, or in Grand Central's case, uh, around about um, 6 o'clock to, to 9 o'clock or thereabouts. Um, from an operations perspective for McDonald's, if the hours were to be 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., which would be similar to what other McDonald's used to be at one point in time. Uh, what does that do to the operation of, of your business? Yeah, I appreciate the question. 24-hour um, trades are a pretty significant part of our business. Um, I think over the last 20 years, McCafe uh, and morning trade um, has changed significantly. So that is a significant part of the McDonald's business. So um, that early morning trade, tradies out on the road going to work, um, breakfast, uh, that day part and that serving is pretty significant. Um, and then we obviously trade pretty strongly through lunch and then dinner as well. So I think the best way I can answer your question is our model is built um, predominantly on 24-hour trade um, and that's what we strive to achieve. Thank, thank you for that. And just noting um, you know, breakfast, the times you've said are, are pretty well could fit within 6 till 10, uh, those times perhaps a little bit earlier than that for tradies. Um, given we have um, you know, reasonable shift workers that come through as well, um, it, it, what sort of percentage of your business would be done, say, between 10 a.m. and 5 a.m.? Oh, I don't have 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., sorry. I, I don't have exact numbers, and it's dependent on location, um, to be honest with you. But um, mm. I, I think the best way I can answer it is our, our business and, and new stores are, are based on um, an expected amount of trade. Um, and that trade is, is generally modelled over 24 hours, so um, that's, it's part of our business, trading 24 hours. Okay. So if the condition was to change, what would that do to this application, if the condition of times would change? Uh, well, we, we would just consider it, but that's, that's all I could say for now. Okay, thanks. Um, councillors, any more questions? Any for the gents there, any questions for any of the submitters? No, there's no further questions. Um, I might uh, ask to reinstate standing orders. Thank you, gents. Councillor Carroll, are we comfortable to reinstate standing orders? There's no, uh, uh, Councillor James, Councillor Melissa, no comments. I just want to give everyone an opportunity. No? Right. No. Councillor Carroll's moved that we reinstate. Councillor Nancy second. Those in favour? That's carried. So <clears throat> we have before us consideration here. Uh, I don't need to read it out, I don't think. Um, material change of use, obviously. Um, 
Councillor Nancy. Uh, Chair, is it an appropriate time now to move an amendment to it? Um, you, if you so wish, yeah. So in support of um, Councillor Carroll earlier, I'd like to see it 10 p.m., that it's not 24 hours. Okay. Um, and whether that's that they open at five or whether they open at six, it's probably debatable, but, um, but certainly that they close at 10 too, because they're so close to that house next door. And, you know, that design, as I said before, it shows no respect for for the neighbours who are very close to that. Um... Kirsten is d busily typing here, so if we just... So do you have five five a.m. or six a.m. opening, um, Councillor Carroll? Did you indicate you wanted to second that? Rightio. So we've got to move in a second. Just the time. Five five a.m. Five a.m. to ten p.m. To ten p.m. It's condition um, eighty nine. If you want to reference the condition. Sorry. It's condition eighty nine. Condition eighty nine. And while they're looking for that, I just wonder um, about the fence um, discussion that we had around the fence that, um, uh, that with the residents' permission that they remove their, their old fence in mm. replacing. I, I, I know that could work. Maybe may, this, a suggestion only um, that the, the um, fence... Um, the acoustic fence is entirely constructed within the applicant's boundary. Um, therefore, um, it gives the neighbour the option to remove their fence, but the ownership is completely um, with uh, the McDonald's. The applicant owns the fence in its entirety because it's on their property. Yeah, it, I get that, but... Um in the interest of good neighbourly um, relations, um, there should be opportunity for them to also remove the neighbour's fence if the neighbour so wants, because the neighbour's fence would be on the boundary, mm. you would assume, and whenever this sort of thing occurs, normally the old fence is removed if the neighbour wants it to be removed. The neighbour may not want it to be removed, but if they do, I think it should be done at McDonald's expense. Yeah, totally um, at the behest of councillors here. I, I know that, um, well, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Richard or one of the officers, uh, when it comes to a retaining wall, um, there are regulations around the setback and a, a fence on top of a retaining wall, whether it's permitted to be exactly on the boundary or set back into the applicant's um, Yeah. Okay. So you would just let the councillors know, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, sorry, I got to adjust that every time. Um, so with regards to setbacks and things like that for, for retaining walls and fences, for a large extent, uh, for the most part, it depends on height and also depends on, um, uh, you know, the height and the actual setback, and it, it will relate, um, largely relate to if it's over a certain height. Um, and I don't know that because it's not a building, I'm not a building uh, certifier. Um, it may need a building approval, but ultimately there's nothing uh, preventing you putting an actual boundary uh, retaining wall right on or hard up against the boundary, just as long as the foundations and the, the actual boundary itself is constructed within your actual property line. Thanks for that clarifying answer. that. As That's I right. said, I stand to be corrected. Um, so, councillors, we have a draft, if we could go to that. Amended motion, moved by Councillor Summerfield, second by Councillor Chair. Taylor. Chair. <coughs> are, you, are we happy with point number two there? Um, Chair, can I just ask a clarifying yes. question? We're just voting on the amendment here, not the full motion, is that correct? Well, this is the amended motion. 
So it's, it's a full, full motion. Full motion. It's, a, it's the new motion. There was a mover and a seconder. I'm just asking for clarity on point two. So if I could just um, get clarity there around... So the neighbour may decide they want to keep their fence. You don't know the hostility or whatever that may or may not be there. Um, and that's saying that it is to be completely removed and replaced, whereas they may say they, they want to keep it. But the only reason I'm adding that in is for that option to be there, that, that McDonald's removed that fence if the neighbour wants it removed. I think we're getting into another area of legislation other than the Planning Act here, which relates to the Fencing Act. And uh, there's probably a council here better qualified to talk about that than myself. But there are rights that parties do have in regard to boundary fences. Yeah. And I think as long as an owner of a, an adjoining uh, property is willing to pay the full cost of the fence, uh, they are able to replace and a, a fence um, because this often crops up in normal residential situations and fences, dogs and kids are a source of great neighbourly problems, as we know. Um, so the Fencing Act does cover a number of these issues we're talking about, so we need to be a little bit careful that we're not treading on the toes of other legislation. But anyway, um, yeah, I think the intent's pretty clear, I think, but uh, I'm happy for councillors to... So you think it's, it's OK to leave that in there then, Stuart? Well, what we're saying here is that uh, we can't have a situation of two fences. Uh, really, there needs to be one fence, and that would have to be the acoustic fence built by McDonald's at McDonald's cost and McDonald's would have to remove the existing fence at its cost. That's basically what we're saying. Yeah. And that would be normal anyway. Most developments, unit developments, and what have you, <coughs> replace the existing fences at the developer's cost. Um, and that's often where we use that condition, just to make sure there's the odd developer that won't want to do that, or they'll want to try and get 50-50 on the fences just yeah. to save a, a cent. But um, basically, that's where we often use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah councillor, that's um, out of our standard condition set. I guess if the property owner had some desperate desire to retain their fence, generally they don't because of obviously, you know, if the developer's building a brand new spanking big yeah. nice fence, then generally they'll, you know, be happy for the old one to be removed. I guess if they had a desperate desire to retain their fence, then that would be something if it became a compliance issue would come back to council and there'd be some discussion around that as to whether, you know, it was okay to, to retain that fence. Thanks. Yes, Councillor. Yeah, I'd just like to make a comment. There may, be, may well be that the person may have an animal or a small child that may want the fence to be retained until the other one's in place. Um, but I think it, uh, you know, as, as Danny Ellis said, it, should there be any, any impediment to this upon consultation, and reasonable consultation, that should happen anyway. You wouldn't want two fences, one beside the other. But it may be that you've got a dog or a small child or something that you want to maintain the safety of the fence until such time as the other one's in place. So the mover and second are happy with that? Yep, so do we... Yeah, you've got a question, Councillor James? Sorry, Councillor Carl, just a quick question. So just, as we mentioned, so around that condition 89, but just, if, just for clarity, so the remainder of... Condition 89 remains as is. It's just the operating hours is the one that we're altering. Is that correct? So the other one around, obviously... Uh, sorry, I'm just bringing it up. It's on page 18 and 57, so that's just around refuse, collection, etc., etc. So everything else on that remains the same. Is that right? So do we need to um, go into a debate, councillors? Yes, we've got an indication. So... Councillor Nancy, would you like to speak to the motion or why? Oh, you know, I think we've chewed the fat quite a bit on this. Um, we have um, worked through um, a lot of ifs, buts, whens, wheres and whys. Uh, we understand that um, we can't uh, base our vote on, um, you know, the health of our community is so much, is so much, in so much as the... Um, 
here we go again with another um, takeaway, um, which is, you know, not healthy food, so to speak. So, but they do have options for healthy food. It's just a matter of what you buy when you go in, I guess. Um, I am very disappointed with the design, as I've expressed previously, um, because it, the driveway is so close to the neighbour. But at the end of the day, I can't use that as a reason to vote against it, I believe. Um, so I just sort of feel that by at least restricting it to 10 p.m., that brings some sort of comfort to, to the neighbours that um, the noise isn't going to continue after 10 p.m. And um, I'm happy to support it. Okay. Not happy, but I'm comfortable to support it based on the planning scheme. Thanks, you. Thanks, Councillor Nancy. Uh, Councillor Shine, you'd like to speak against the... Uh, yes, I, I speak against the motion. Uh, not so much that I, I certainly do believe that um, closing it at 10pm is a move in the right direction, but I, I don't think it should be there at all. Um, I appreciate, uh, uh, bearing in mind what Richard had to say before, that we can't oppose it on the grounds of health or, or social impact uh, uh, aspects. Um, but I do mention that members of the public have said to me that they are concerned about the attraction uh, of this uh, uh, Maccas would be to school children across the road uh, in a busy four-lane highway, one of the busiest in Toowoomba, uh, that would, uh, uh, may be an inducement for them, young kids, to, to cross the road in, inappropriately and, in, and, and endanger themselves. And other members of the public have indicated to me, rightly or wrongly, that they would see a all-night open restaurant uh, as a uh, appropriate meeting place or inappropriate meeting place for undesirables in the community to, uh, uh, to, to meet. Um, so uh, but they're not, uh, on our advice, appropriate uh, reasons to oppose uh, this, uh, uh, this motion. Uh, but I do so on a number of other aspects. One is the traffic impacts that really hasn't been talked about today, uh, particularly in Jones Street. Um, as a frequent visitor to North Point Shopping Centre, trying to egress uh, the shopping centre via Jones Street, particularly in the late afternoon, is a, uh, a problem now. There's, uh, cars are backed up well into the uh, shopping centre. Uh, with added traffic uh, because one assumes the proprietors will want McDonald's to be a, um, a successful business, will attract more traffic to that uh, area uh, and uh, it will cause added congestion, uh, particularly in Jones Street. Uh, the noise aspect, um, uh, irrespective of what the um, evidence or the reports that we've heard, uh, read and heard about today. Uh, I uh, happened to be up at North Point this morning and I decided I'd, I'd drop by uh, that neighbour's residence next door to uh, the proposal in um, Ruffin Street. And as I pulled up, he pulled up and I had a conversation with him. He's now got a for sale sign up on his property. Um, and uh, from his point of view, if it's sold as a residential property at the moment, uh, he'll be lucky to get much of a price at all. Uh, he's probably hoping that that strip type development will occur or will, will be imagined by an investor uh, that that's likely to happen in the future and he's hoping for a high price. The reason he's selling is because uh, he fears uh, the noise and the interruption to his, to his um, uh, way of life uh, uh, at that place. Um, the zoning aspect of it, um, prima facie, it is a low-medium zone. There's no doubt about that. But our, uh, legis the legislation provides for, the, uh, for it to be considered uh, pursuant to the strategic framework, as we've heard. Uh, but it does refer to uh, local need um, as opposed to local wants. And in my view, I would have thought a McDonald's restaurant, uh, the desire to go there is a, is a want as opposed to a need that may have been 
the subject to, of legal argument in the Planning and Environment Court, uh, contrary to my view, but uh, on the face of it, there is a difference between a, a need and a want, and I would have thought Macus was a want rather than a need. Um, and finally, uh, I did ask Richard earlier today about that stormwater issue. I think when you look at the lay of the land, it's at least a very optimistic solution to that stormwater issue, and I certainly wouldn't like to, uh, uh, to own the house below it in, in Wattle Street. Uh, for those reasons, I uh, will uh, oppose the, uh, the motion. Thanks, Councillor Kerry. Uh, do we have a speaker for the motion? Thank you, Councillor Cole. I've seconded the motion. So I probably uh, agree with many of the points from Councillor Shine. Um, the reason I, I seconded this and brought it up is that the present planning scheme is predicated on local need. Now, whether you like that or whether you don't, that's what it's predicated on. And, and it has reasons there that you can come out of that, and this is outside of that. So the reason I support the reduced um, opening hours is because of that. If it's to be local need, then that's when it should be. And also lining up with the shops that are already in the shopping centre. I think it is a disappointment that the strip development will occur or may occur or whatever, and I certainly am aware of the impacts on the people who live there. We had an opportunity to make Jones Street the barrier, but obviously I'm on a hiding to nothing, so I'd prefer to change the opening hours. I also have concerns about the conflict of pedestrians and vehicles in Jones Street because down the back of Willow Street is a park and the velodrome as well. So there are a lot of people who go down there to use the park and uh, on a weekend, uh, as Councillor Shine says, I don't know how many people go down there, but on weekends there's quite a lot of use of that park and uh, a lot of children down there. So, I mean, I do worry about that. But having been told and led to believe that we can't really refuse this, I'd rather uh, support the changing of the opening hours, which now align or more align with what the shops are that are actually already existing in the shopping centre. But I do believe... Having said that, that it is a, a shame we've missed the opportunity to limit strip development by using Jones Street. But, um, you know, I can only hope for the people that live there that perhaps the whole block will go. So, you know, I, uh, I don't... Um, I, I'm speaking on the lesser of two evils, I suppose. Thanks, Councillor Carroll. I have a speaker for the motion. Or against, sorry. Any speakers against? Councillor Nancy, would you like to sum up? I would, Mr Chair, and um, it'll be an unusual summing up because um, having listened to Councillor Shine and going back to what I raised earlier and Councillor Carroll raised some of it as well, the strip development, um, serving day-to-day -day, um, convenience needs of the immediate local residents and it should be located on land with direct access to a distributor or sub-arterial or regional arterial road on those three bases, plus um, Councillor Kerry's very good arguments. Um, I'll be voting against it, which okay. is my right. OK, so that's, um, that's interesting. Um, so as a... Closing statements as a chair. Um, I think we're um, we're uh, in not such a good position when we consider the strategic framework uh, and how it can override the local community and the zoning and intent of an area. I think that's that's rather confusing for me as a as a lay person in a councillor's role, an elected representative's role. And I raise that in closing comments here because any one of us as residents, and I say every one of us in this room as residents, only appreciate at best a degree of certainty when we uh, buy into an area, live in an area, and appreciate amenity and lifestyle in, uh, I think there is a, the potential, not potential, the very real prospect of an erosion of amenity 
and the collective impacts of potential strip development as I raised uh, with this type of development jumping north of Jones Street. It was a natural boundary to a, an activity centre, in my view, which is pretty sad. <clears throat> um, I, I think, the as I've stated before on other applications that have come before this council, I do not believe that the broader traffic impacts have been unpacked definitively. Um, I can foresee and having fre and frequenting that area sometimes almost daily and using Wattle Street myself to avoid the already congested uh, intersection and people exiting from that shopping centre onto Jones Street, turning right to go north or south into Rutheran Street. Um, is diabolical and I use Wattle Street to head north to home. Um, I can foresee a lot more rat running and therefore I, I am not clear in my mind that the broader traffic impacts have been unpacked sufficiently. Um, I think that's about all I'll say. There's some other things there. Um, but most of all, from a planning perspective, I think amenity is at risk here for a local neighbourhood. Um, so with that, I would now ask uh, that councillors show by raise of hands those who are in favour of the amended motion before us here now. That's three, that is Three, four, those against? So let me, so there's one, two. Councillor Tim, you were four, weren't you? Yep, okay. So the uh, motion is lost. So councillors, we need to give some reasons as to why we um, did not support the application. Chair, you'll have to record the votes because we've got a, a, a yes. somebody out of the room as well. Yeah, thanks. thanks. So that was uh, Councillor Carroll. Of oh, those four was Councillor Tim, Councillor James, Councillor Jeff, and myself, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Nancy, Councillor Melissa, and Councillor Kerry were against. So, Councillors. Uh, I think uh, I don't think it's too hard to fish for reasons why uh, we're against it. I think uh, many of those have been aired by the speakers today, and uh, I just think it's the wrong place for it. <coughs> so, okay, we need to. So, well, uh, um, I um, I <laughs> oppose the motion on the basis that the, in my view, uh, the. Uh, uh, application did not meet the, uh, uh, the safety, uh, sorry, did not meet the uh, uh, traffic uh, impact uh, issue, uh, the noise issue, uh, my interpretation of the zoning issue and, the, and serious doubts about the stormwater issues. There were also um, the ones about the um, conflicting with the zoning which was um, strip development um, and serving day-to-day -day convenience needs of uh, immediate local residents and um, located on land with direct access to a distributor um, sub-arterial and regional arterial road. So we we'll just, I might get you to go through those a little bit slower, Councillor Nancy, so on, Kirsten can it. capture that. <coughs> Just say when you're ready. Yep. yep. You ready? Yep. Okay, so strip development or expanding existing centre. OK, 
Okay. Serving day-to-day -day convenience needs of immediate local residents. And located on land with direct access to a distributor, sub-arterial and regional, or, or regional arterial road. Can we just get that last one again? Yes, yeah, sorry, answer. it's a bit, it's a bit. Located on land with direct access to a distributor, sub-arterial or regional arterial road. What you're saying is that gains its access off a local road, is that what you're saying? Basically, yes, instead yep. of, inst which is confusing with the current zoning. Yep. Yep. Or conflicting with the current zoning, sorry. You're right with that, Councillor Nancy. Yep. Can, can I add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or expand it. So, scribblings and things. So, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, based on, based, sorry, based on the current zoning, if that could be added at the end. Is that right, Danielle? Would that conflicts, be right? conflicts with the local zone. Mm. Conflicts with the current zone. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Conflict conflicts with the current zone. With mm. current. Oh. And conflicts with the. Conflicts, with not and, but conflicts with the current zoning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The zone says that it will ensure the amenity and lifestyle of residents in the low and medium density requirement zone is conserved and provide mechanisms to promote and implement a mix of housing forms at a density approach. That's what the zone says. And the other thing is that this design of this development is not considerate or compatible with the surrounding residential built form. Okay, so would... Let's let's distill that a bit so we're not doubling up on no, that's what Bear with us, councillors. Danielle, can we perhaps suggest a progressive erosion of amenity to the local zoned area?
Yes. Happy with that? It's not Thank compatible, you. yeah. So we're happy councillors. Now do we need we need to vote on do we do we need another motion? Or they're, they're no, the, I don't. I don't believe we do. We could well, we refused advice, it, so we've given grounds. But I think we have to give conditions, and if we're happy with those conditions, uh, I think we should be right. Um, we can probably ask the acting CEO about that. No, let's. So the council refused. Yes. So we need to have a mover and a second of that council refuse. refuse the application based on these reasons. Yeah. Excuse me, Chair. Yes, Councillor Mel. Um, I'd like to ask a question yep. um, because I, I, I don't. I want to understand the procedure here. So I voted against that previous motion that had the amendment put to it, but the reasons for the voting against, my voting against, are not those reasons there. Well, that's... So that's obviously my right. Um, so do I need to give my reason for voting against the previous motion? By all means, yeah. You, you can add it into... Would you like mm. to...? Because my, my reason for voting against was I did not agree with the um, amended opening hours that was put forth by the, um, by the amendment. Yeah. So, so, so wouldn't it? Yeah, it'll be the most appropriate. Council's at a point now. You, you voted on an amended motion, which has been lost. Council's now at a point uh, on the on the basis of the following reasons is what that was lost. Council's at a point now where the council can now move a motion to either refuse the development, if that's the direction council wishing to go, or council may, somebody else may, in the council may wish to move a, a different motion to that. So that, that, the floor is open to that right at the moment. Thank so you. through you, Councillor Melissa. Thank you. So. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that, uh, I move that, the, um, that the application be refused along those grounds. On those grounds? Thank you. So you're seconding Councillor Nancy? Do we have any debate on that? I think it's done to do it. Right. So those in favour of this refusal, based on the grounds given there, um, those in favour? So that's uh, myself, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Nancy, Councillor Kerry. Uh, those against, <laughs> Councillor Tim, Councillor Melissa, Councillor James, Councillor Jeff. You have a castle? Yeah, he does. <laughs> You'll so have to I, use your vote, Bill. I, I support the uh, refusal on the grounds of, uh, as put, put there. Thank you. Thanks for putting me in that position, <laughs> colleagues. Um, no, being no further business, uh, that concludes um, the meeting for this afternoon. Thanks, councillors. Thanks, gallery. And thanks, officers.